Greetings to you. My name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 197. How to make the corrections examiners ask of you and your thesis. A big one. This vlog comes by a request from Rowida. Hello Rowida, a great request. And this is an unusual vlog because it is a vlog that at some point every single one of you will have to use because in the overwhelming majority of cases a PhD is passed with correction. The unicorn result, the double A, the double one result occurs in anywhere between four and eight percent of PhD results uh, so it's very much a rare, rare outcome. So if you do a PhD, if you pass through examination then yes you will have corrections. So just about every single one of you are going to have to read those examiner's reports and do something. And we're going to talk about what that something means in the vlog this week. Now, sadly, some bad advice in this area that I hear a great deal and it's so wrong, it's just horrendous. But the bad advice I hear in this area is, all oh, right, will you address examiner reports on your PhD in the same way as you address reader or referee reports for an article or a book? Uh, yeah, nah. So nah. And I'll tell you what the difference is. If you receive reader reports or referee reports on an article or a book, and obviously reader two is always a moron. I understand that reader two always has challenges. And say you receive those referee or reader's reports on your article and you don't like it. You don't like it. So reader two's really just gone on some random journey and you go, well, you know what, if I make those changes, this article transforms. So you know what, I'm going to take my business, I'm going to take this article or this book and move it to another publisher or another journal. And that is your right. And that's a great thing to do, that's brilliant. But in the case of examiner's reports, they are examiner reports. You can't move to other examiners. These are your examiner reports and unless you address these corrections you are not going to receive your PhD. Now you may hate those reports, you may swear a great deal, you may wish your examiners dead in a strange boating accident, that's fine. But they are your examiners and you cannot ignore them. You can't simply call them stupid or ignorant and move on with the rest of your life because if you do that, you won't get your PhD. So you have to, have to, take their commentary seriously. You're not going to receive that degree unless you take the commentary seriously. And look, I've certainly seen some weird stuff when supervisors or students respond to examiner's reports. And I always find it so amazing when supervisors particularly go absolutely bonkers at examiner's reports. And I sort of have to gently remind them, with the greatest respect colleague, you're complaining about those examiners. You selected those examiners. You selected those examiners, so it's a bit late now, girlfriend. But also, you know, it's not only the supervisors have selected them, they've gone through higher degree coordinators to evaluate the choice, conflict of interest, and people like me check very carefully, is there anything amiss here? How are we going? Have we got a good set of examiners? So quality assurance is in place going in. So just because you don't like the outcome, it's a little bit late to describe your examiner as the spawn of Satan. Now, I've had a lot of students, when they read examiner's reports, describe their examiners as Nazis. I wish I was joking, Nazis. I've had supervisors state, after reading an examiner's report, that look, that examiner report has resulted in a mental health concern for me, and I'm not going to read that report again to protect my well-being. That was a supervisor who actually selected those examiners. So therefore, let's cut away the operatic excesses here. This is a PhD 
examination. Remember the noun, examination. You are being assessed whether or not you are good enough to get this degree. You do not have control over what your examiners say about you and your research, but you do have control over how you respond and engage with those comments. So let's do this. My job in this vlog, I think, is twofold. Firstly, I'm preparing you intellectually. So how do you address? How do you respond to examiner's commentary? How do you do that? So we're going to be handling that today. But also, I'm just trying to get you organized emotionally because months go by while, stu while students stay in this sort of emotionally volatile environment. The clock is ticking. You're wasting time. So part of what I'm doing today is preparing you emotionally. Remember that you are not your PhD, your personality, your sense of self is different from this degree, but it is a degree. And so it has to be treated with respect. And look, you can grumble bum as much as you like. Go for it, okay. But this is an examination and quality assurance is required. And just so you know, if you go, oh look, I'll sort of address a few of the examiner's reports and the stuff I disagree with, I won't address, I'm sorry. This is the highest degree awarded in a university. If you think you can address a few of them and we're golden, uh, you would be wrong. Because once you put your amendments, your corrections in place in a table that is assessed, you put it in place, you sign it off, your supervisor has to sign it off, <laughs> your higher degree coordinator has to assign it off, and then finally me, Dean of Graduate Research or my international equivalent, looks at every single set of corrections and signs them off. And sometimes that only takes me five or six hours to confirm that those amendments are in place. For the more complicated cases, it can take me an entire working week to confirm that those amendments are in place. So this is very serious and it's not about you having an opinion or maybe correcting some of them. This is an international quality assurance protocol. So what I'm gonna do is give you 10, quick tips to get you emotionally but also intellectually organized. So these are the corrections you have to make. Now get on with it. This is how you confront them from the easiest stuff to the really most complex of corrections. So one, most important one, take your emotions out of the process. There is a Propian folk tale narrative that emerges in response to examiner's reports. So when a student receives the reports, every single student goes through the same narrative. And this is even when the reports can I say are really, really good. So an examiner has spent five pages saying how truly amazing this thesis is, what a great student this is, what great research, five pages. They've spent one paragraph at the end talking through the corrections or the amendments to be made and the student becomes completely fixated on the paragraph and not the five pages. So the emotional narrative that students pass through is firstly, shock, horror, embarrassment, self-loathing. So they sit on the beanbag of self-loathing for a time. So I'm not worthy, I'm a mess, I knew I couldn't do this, the examiner said I can't do this, so you're not really reading things correctly, you're irrational and you're blaming yourself and you're in sort of a bit of a loathing space. So you will get there, that's okay. People sit there for a while. I've seen people sit there for about eight months. But often then the movement is from self-blame to blaming others. And of course, the biggest target that you blame is your supervisor. So your supervisor is to blame for not supervising you correctly and choosing some dud examiners. So then the, the blame shifts to the examiners and I often get an email of three to five to 10 pages where the student explains in great detail why their supervisor is the antichrist. Okay, so the blame then moves to the supervisor. And you know, students can sit there for a while and blame the supervisor. And then what happens, there is a third stage of blame where of course you blame the examiners for, well, examining. And we often get phrases in the office like, who do they think they are? Who do they think they are saying that to me? Girlfriend, they're your examiners. They're doing their job. They're meant to be examining. That's what they've just done. Who do they think they are? They are your examiners. Okay, they're examining you. So try and move through this relatively irrational narrative 
as quickly as you can because self-loathing and blame will not get those amendments done. So park your emotions and as soon as you can, I get my students to do this the day after the examiner reports have been released, I get the students to create their table of amendments, turn track changes onto their PhD document and start making those corrections. So get the emotions out and just start getting some momentum with the scholarly work. Now, I know it feels like you've got no control over this process. You do. Your control is not over the examination, but your control is how you handle and manage those corrections. And you know what? You have full control over that. Two, <laughs> respect your examiners even if you disagree with them. The examiners are not wrong. Let me state that again. The examiners are not wrong. They are raising legitimate concerns for a reason. So what you have to do is understand, manage and mitigate those reasons. The abuse I hear from students about very senior academics who happen to have examined them is remarkable. And what I'd ask is, you need to really change this behaviour. You need to approach your examination and examiners with respect. Because what we're learning here is an important meta skill. You can disagree with a colleague, you can disagree with an academic, but respect their right to offer that perspective in their way. Now remember, these examiners have taken three or four days, perhaps a week, perhaps in one case we had a, a gentleman who took 40 hours that he spread throughout the entire month, remarkable commitment, to offer their views. And they are offering their views from expertise for very little money, okay? So they're doing it for the benefit of international higher education. So therefore it's important that we thank them for their commentary because they are doing it to improve your work. Three, really important. Don't react to the examiner's comments. Respond to their commentary. Move from reaction to response. Now I've had students, as I've said, you know, read their reports and refer to their examiners as Nazis. Blew my mind as well. And my personal favourite Nazi moment was when a student was sitting in my office and proceeded to read the examiner reports to me and at a certain point described an examiner as a Nazi and threw the papers across the desk at me. And the weird thing is, the story doesn't end there. I then re actually read those examiner reports and they were pretty good. <laughs> They were actually pretty benign. So stop yourself reacting and start to respond to the comments. The examiners are offering you a commentary for a reason. You need to ask why you. You have to recognize that you have done something whereby your meaning was not clear. You, 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 you. And if an examiner missed it, so you made the point, oh, they missed it. They missed it. It means you didn't present that point with enough clarity, with enough succinctness. They missed it. Now I'm going to use an example of this from my wonderful student Sue, who you met in the vlog last week and was my great student. She wrote a brilliant thesis, absolutely brilliant thesis, edgy, provocative, risky thesis, right? Really risky. And it was highly innovative. And when she had a problem emerge empirically with her control group, she moved from chapter four into a theoretical thesis, right? Wow, risky, powerful, but it was one of the best theses I've ever read. And she did that in chapter four. And she spent four pages in chapter four explaining the movement in the thesis, the pivot from the empirical to the theoretical. And you know, that was a section and it was called in the chapter rationale for the movement from the empirical to the theoretical. Okay, now one of her examiners stated that he didn't recognize or see the rationale for the shift, the movement from empirical to theoretical, didn't see the rationale. 
Now, Sue and I could have, reacting, Nazi, uh, we could have gone, well, look, in chapter four, pages 238 to 242, there's the heading, there's the rationale. Now, that's reacting, right? Now, we could have done that. Now, Sue and I are old war horses. We didn't do that. We had a secret smile with each other over Skype. And then we went, right, so how are we going to respond to this? So how we responded was, right, we went, there's not enough there. So we moved the four pages of commentary to eight. We added some very important theoretical and methodological discussion around that. So we doubled the length. We also talked about that movement from empirical to theoretical in the introduction of chapter four and the conclusion of chapter four. So we dovetailed it. And we also mentioned it in the introduction of the thesis and the conclusion of the thesis. So we could have reacted and pointed and gone, well, look, there it is there, mate, you missed it. But instead we've gone, you know what? The shift wasn't explained effectively enough. Let's go back in, let's go in again and use this commentary to improve it. And that's what we did, that's what Sue did, and Sue graduated three weeks ago. Okay, four, address the corrections. You don't have to agree with them. The greatest error that students make when they're dealing with corrections of a PhD is they treat each correction like it's Vegemite. I like that. I like that point. I like that commentary. I mm, like that. Don't like that. Corrections are not Vegemite. It's not about liking it or not liking it. That's irrelevant. No one is asking you to like your corrections. No one cares. No one's asking you to agree with your corrections because this is an examination. So if you think your examiner is a moron, a Nazi, or has got it completely wrong, take a breath and acknowledge that they have missed your argument. So therefore you need to address the issues with much greater clarity why you've handled this matter, this research problem, in this particular way. You've got to really show why you made those decisions and write that up, put paragraphs in about that. So address the issues raised by the examiners. Don't dismiss them and explain with succinctness why you made those particular decisions. That is addressing the correction. Five. And this is important for a particular group. Don't be overwhelmed, particularly if we're dealing with C's, so major corrections, either a double C or a C. So quite challenging, so it's a fair whack of correction to make, right? So they're the C results, major corrections. Don't be overwhelmed. Start with the easiest text-based corrections and writing-based corrections. So point five is an important one here. Sometimes you're going to get an examiner that lists every single typographical spelling and grammatical error that you have made in the thesis. I have certainly seen about one in 10 reports do this. People list every single error in the thesis. It can take 12 to 20 pages. So they've done you an incredible favor. A PhD should not be submitted with those errors. To be frank with you, if you've got a spelling error in a thesis, that is an embarrassment. And the idea that an examiner has had to tell you that, well, good luck with that. So therefore, right, you've got these bulk of corrections to do. So start there, address the spelling errors, address the typographical or grammatical errors, log them on your amendment sheet, and be grateful that the examiner has taken the time to log these issues. So get yourself organized, make the corrections, make the amendments first, these ones, and that'll help you get the momentum. So you're actually getting a bulk of very simple corrections made. Six, consider and understand the perspective of the examiner and contextualize their commentary in relation to that perspective. Now examiners are different people from you. They've had different disciplinary training, a different international perspective, and that's a productive difference. They've lived different lives, they've had different training, and also they have different expectations. We see this, I think, particularly in nanoscale science. I've chaired a lot of oral exams around the world whereby the student is a chemist and the examiner is a physicist, very common combination these days, and the examiner in an oral exam states, well, you know what, right now I know you're a chemist, 
but we are going to just check and verify your expertise in some physics. And I've seen that done overtly in exams. Now, when you're in systems without oral examinations, the examiners can't ask those questions. So they're having to use the script, use the PhD document as a proxy to assess your wider interdisciplinary expertise. Okay, so realize that there are areas like obviously nanotech, biomed, cultural studies, media studies, an array of allied health professions where these areas are cauldrons of multiple disciplines and examiners are offering their expertise from a particular perspective and that will skew what they do with your thesis. So you need to respect that standpoint and respect that it is different from yours. Respect the difference and therefore explain your arguments more overtly in the thesis in relation to that perspective. So the corrections or the amendments you make with these sort of commentaries is you're very clear about this is my perspective, these other perspectives are available and log them, okay? And of course that leads us to seven, the biggie, confirm your disciplinary clarity, your disciplinary expertise, particularly if you're working in transdisciplinarity, anti-disciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, or where I live these days, post-disciplinarity. These are my people, these are my students, so I really get that. Yeah, these theses are the most difficult to examine because you're never going to find a single examiner who can cover the arc of the entire thesis. So what students need to do in addressing these commentaries, where it happens quite frequently here, where an examiner will go, well look, I, this area wasn't addressed. Why wasn't this area addressed? So how do you correct that? Okay, And therefore what you do is you add a series of paragraphs, linking paragraphs, throughout the thesis that explains clearly what you are doing and also what you are not doing. One way to address pretty deep theoretical, epistemological or methodological differences is to offer that clarity about your positioning. So connect your original contribution to knowledge to your disciplinary perspective while logging the other alternatives that are available. Very, very hard to do, but that is a strategy throughout the thesis to, to guide, to provide those signposts, if you will, for examiners to understand what you are doing and what you're not doing. And that addresses those post-disciplinary examiner reports, which are quite challenging. Eight. Remember that examiners are providing you with an opportunity, so take that opportunity. So many of these vlogs are ensuring that you, our next generation of scholars, are intellectually generous, right? And that starts with your examination reports. The worst of academic life is brittle, it's narrow, it's selfish, and it's self-absorbed. So therefore, treat examiner reports as an opportunity to improve. Your examiners are doing you a favour. You're about to get a large amount of this material published and they have helped you improve it so that referee reports won't pick these errors up and that will enable future opportunities in your career and also publications. Nine. Right, now we're getting crunchy. Managing the divergent comments. So most examiners feature different marks or gradings from different examiners. So it's very, very rare in examination where you get two A's, two B's, two C's, two D's. It's very rare that both examiners, particularly without an oral exam, end up with the same result. Okay, so you've got different evaluations from different examiners. So how do you handle that? And can I say in systems with oral exams, I should say they're much more consensual systems. So examiners may come to the oral exam with relatively divergent views, but they get together, they're talking, they're asking questions, they're hearing answers. And so what happens even when examiners start with quite divergent perspectives to the research, they come together a bit more. Now in the Australian system and many other systems, we have completely independent examination. So the examiners don't know who the other ones are and don't know what they've done. So what do you do when two examiners offer alternative views on the same point? <laughs> now what frequently happens is students throw up their hands at that point. They go, well look, obviously the person that agreed with them was right and the person who, who disagreed with them was, was Satan. Okay, 
but instead recognise that you, the great researchers take those divergent commentaries and then say, you know what, I wonder why the approaches were divergent. Why did the difference occur? And wow, if you can write that paragraph, why the difference occurred, that is really, really powerful. Now, it may be for disciplinary reasons, it might be methodological, it could also be a political difference. So aim for clarity and explain intellectually why these differences emerge. Now, if you're doing radical work on the political economy, the carbon economy, the green economy, the blue economy, these are volatile areas. So respect the volatility and go with it and contextualize it. Okay, point 10. And here we go. Managing the politically volatile examiner. So when you've got the, what I call the big split, or the nasty split. So one examiner actually pretty well liked it a lot and another examiner really had some issues with it. What are you going to do with that? And remember when I say big issues like re-examination, restructure, this isn't a PhD, it's a master's or indeed a straight fail. Okay. So there are reasons why the big or the nasty split occurs. They are often methodological. We see that in allied health very frequently. So just people are wedded to a particular mixed methods palette. And if they don't see that, they let you know about it, right? But also epistemologically, but also, of course, political differences. And the biggest splits that I have seen, yeah, AF, emerge as a result of the thesis not matching the examiner's expectations. So often in these cases, by the way, what happens is a third examiner comes in. They're brought into the process to, if you, if you like, offer a third view, a third data point to work out exactly what's occurring here. Now, what I did in preparation for this vlog is I read the angriest examiner's reports that have come in at Flinders University. So our top 10 of reports, okay? So I read those again. And you know what? Reading them through that gauze, I realized how they occurred. The reason the examiners gave those outcomes was a clash between what they expected the thesis to be and what the research actually delivered. So a student selected a title that had absolutely nothing to do with the thesis. The student missed a huge slice of literature and the examiner was angry about it. But also in the clinical and professional field, allied health also, but you're thinking particularly museum studies, so those sorts of areas, if there is any whiff of a disrespect of clinical education, a disrespect of a practitioner's expertise, then aggressive splits emerge. So the way to handle those sort of mismatches in expectations are actually much simpler than you think. Change the title change the abstract, reframe the introduction, reframe the conclusion, noting the areas that the thesis does not address. Remember, I always say to our brand new students, we've got a whole group of students about to start shortly with us, and when I'm doing the induction or the orientation, I say to the students, in your introduction, I want you to specify, yes, this is your original contribution to knowledge, this is what I'm talking about, but spend three or four paragraphs, spend a page, talking about what you're not talking about, okay? So what happens is then, so the supervisor, in the, if the examiner in the introduction goes, oh, right, right, well, that's what we're dealing with. We're not dealing with that. Oh, right, okay. So that means examiners are not spending 100,000 words waiting for them to see what they're expecting to see. And I've, I've examined theses like that, I haven't failed them, but when I'm waiting for the big name in the field to be mentioned. So I'm, I, there's this fantastic area, this is a really important scholar, really important theoretical idea, and I'm reading 100,000 words, waiting for the student to mention it, okay? And I, and I get cross, where is it? And of course, if in the introduction they've gone, look, I'm aware this area, this field, this scholar exists, this thesis is not going into that area for these reasons, then I can go, okay, well, look, I may disagree with you, but now I'm going to follow you through your argument and I'm not going to spend the next 100,000 words looking for this scholar, okay? So the student, therefore, needs to frame clearly their original contribution to knowledge, their disciplinary, their methodological focus, and acknowledge overtly, in some cases, the political volatility of this field. And that honesty will be appreciated. 
And that is the strategy to pull back from and address those really, really messy examiner reports. So the most important thing is don't panic. Receive your examiner reports with gratitude. They're doing you a favour. And address and improve your work with clarity, with consciousness and with respect. And that is how you get a PhD to graduation. I wish you all love, light and peace. Tea out.